give you a different perspective on social media and obviously the kind of uh, the idea of uh, freedom of speech, free discussion and so on is, is a big part of that world as well. Um, but I want to give you a probably slightly unusual perspective on social media that you might not have heard before, which is a historical one. And um, so in order to do that, I need to probably start by saying what I think social media is. So this is my definition of social media. It's media, crucially, that we get from other people. Um, and it's where information travels along social connections, and this creates a distributed community or discussion. So me talking to you now, this is not social media, because I'm not using technology to talk to you. I'm just using my voice. If I was playing a song with a guitar, that would be media. That would be a kind of media, I think, because it would be using the medium of music and guitar. Uh, and if I was talking to you via radio, I think that would count as media, that would be a broadcast. But just, uh, just you know, talking isn't media. It, the whole point about this is that you can have a distributed discussion using technologies, um, as we know from Facebook <coughs> and, and uh, Twitter and so forth. Um, so that's how I define social media, and I'm defining media to mean the use of technology to communicate. Uh, so we know what this looks like. You get this sort of network diagram that some people know other people, and someone over here talks about something and tells this person, and they tell this person, and this person over here happens to be a member of both of these groups, and so they have the ability to transmit things that are being talked about, ideas, and so on, uh, from this group over to this group, and you get this ripple effect across across social media. Now, my point is that we don't actually, although we do all of this with digital networks today, we don't actually need digital networks to do this. Uh, it's not a prerequisite. Uh, and in fact, I think social media environments where you get this kind of person-to-person -person transmission of, of information and knowledge and gossip have existed for centuries. Um, and so I wrote a book that came out in 2013 where I went and traced the origins of social media back as far as I could and went to look at historical social media systems to see if they had any lessons for us today. And I've done this before, most of my books, um, I basically tell the same joke over and over again. Uh, I go and find something that's happening in the world today and go, well, this looks new, but actually it's not really new. And my first book was called The Victorian Internet, which you can kind of guess the joke there. Uh, the Victorians had the Telegraph Network, it was their internet, and all the things that happened on the internet happened on the Telegraph Network first, the online weddings and the cyber crime and the hype and the changes to business practices, and you get the message. Um, anyway, so I did the same with uh, social media, and I traced back as far as I could, and I concluded that the earliest example of social media can be found in the late Roman Republic. <laughs> uh, and so here we are, this is uh, Terentius Neo, and he was a, a baker in Pompeii. So of course you know that that didn't end terribly well. Um, this is the reason why this, uh, this picture of him and his wife has survived, which was, um, it was a, a painting of them in their, in their villa in Pompeii. He did quite well for himself. He started off as a baker and he went into politics and he was elected to be a local official. Um, and so um, as a result, he ended up uh, doing quite nicely and was able to afford this nice selfie of, him, of himself. <laughs> um, and, and as always with selfies, selfies are uh, trying to send a message, you know, look how beautiful I am, look how fantastic. Um, and uh, that's kind of what's happening in this case. These, uh, both of these Romans here are advertising their literacy as well as their wealth. So you can see that Tarantius here has a papyrus scroll. I have forgotten my papyrus I usually bring a piece of papyrus so you can see what it looks like. Basically it's about this big because it's limited by the, uh, the geometry of the papyrus plant. When you chop it up, there's a limit to how big you can make a piece of papyrus. So if you want to make a great big one, you have to stick several bits together. But the natural size of it is about that big and then it rolls up into something about this big. Uh, and this little tag on it is in fact the equivalent of the spine of a book. So when you put a whole load of uh, rolls on a shelf in a cubby hole, you can see which one's which because you can look at the tags. So he is holding probably a volume of a book, it could also be a letter, but that has got a tag on it suggests that it's probably part of a book. Uh, he's saying, look at me, I can read. Uh, meanwhile, his point, as you can see, is the proud owner of a Samsung Galaxy Note 4. What is the Roman equivalent thereof? She's got uh, essentially a notebook. And what's probably happening here is that he ran the business and she did the back office and she was doing the accounts and all that sort of thing. Um, and what she's holding with the stylus there um, is the Roman equivalent of, of, of a notepad. Uh, so this is, in fact, a bunch of uh, wooden panels with wax on them and they were put together like a sort of page of a book, but it was a bit thicker than that. And you would carry them around, you could scratch uh, notes using the stars into the wax, and then when you wanted to run them out, you'd just smooth the wax over. 
Uh, so this was how the Romans would make notes and carry notes around without having to use expensive papyrus and ink, and it's all a bit of a fact that we want to do it in the other way. So this is what they would use. Uh, so again, she is advertising her literacy. And this is why we get social media in the Roman Republic for the first time, because in order to have a social media ecosystem, you need two things. You need a certain amount of literacy, because people need to be able to read and write. Uh, and the Roman period sees you know, the, really the first example of widespread literacy um, in the Western world. Uh, so by no means everyone is literate, but a much larger, you know, all the middle class people are literate, which is unusual up to that point. Uh, previously, you know, in, in Egypt and in Mesopotamia, basically only the scribal class and maybe the ruling class were literate, but most people were. Here, the Romans, average Roman, is, uh, average Roman who isn't a slave, uh, is likely to be able to read and write a few words. Uh, and get things like graffiti and so on. Uh, the other thing you need, apart from literacy, for a social media environment to work, is you need it to be very, very cheap to copy and deliver information. And these days, of course, it's very cheap to copy and deliver information because we have computers and broadband networks and so on. Uh, so we can, you know, with a single tap on a keyboard or a we can duplicate an entire book or movie or, and we can send things across the internet and so on. So the Romans would do that, but they had their own equivalent of broadband, which was slavery. So basically, if you were a Roman and you owned some slaves, then the marginal cost of an extra page was zero, uh, because you just say to your slave, I really like this book, uh, could you make a copy of it? And they would then, you'd basically have to wait for it to download, as it were, and you'd have to wait for them to copy that for you. Um, so that was, that was if you, once you bought a slave and you were paying for their upkeep and so on, uh, you were trying to find uh, sufficient use for the capacity of that slave to copy things out and write things and, uh, and so on. And then when it came to delivering information, wealth of Romans at least, um, often had people they employed full time as messengers. And um, so I would give my messages, and they would often be rounds. I lived in Rome, they might do a regular rounds during the day, they would take messages that I was writing to my friends in Rome, and they would bring their replies back. Uh, and so, um, and, and then my friends themselves might have their own uh, delivery people, they're called tabulari. Uh, but essentially, I mean, if you were wealthy, you could copy things and deliver things really quite quickly. You could send a message across the road and get a reply in a, an hour or two. Um, in fact, you might scribble it on one of these tablets, uh, and then it would be carried to the recipient, and they would scribble their answer and be brought back to you. Um, so, this was something that was possible in the Roman period, and it hadn't really been possible before. And the best example we have of this whole system in action is the letters of Cicero. Um, and you can see how this all worked in the, in the, uh, in the letters of Cicero. Um, here is an example of an excerpt of one of them. So Cicero is writing to his friend Atticus, and he and Atticus wrote to each other most days. But he even wrote to each other when they have nothing to say. They say things like, write to me anyway, because even if you have nothing to say, they write to say, well, I don't know what's really happening. But anyway, they have the messages going back and forth, so they might as well send something. Um, anyway, in this particular case, you can see that Cicero is saying to Atticus, I sent you on March 24th, a copy of Balbus's letter to me and Caesar's letter to him. Uh, and this tells us quite a lot about how letters were being passed around in the Roman period. The Roman period was a bunch of intermarried families, and the gossip, the social gossip, and the political gossip were one and the same. So in order to stay ahead of the politics, you really needed to stay on top of who was marrying who, and who was divorcing who, and all that sort of stuff. And the way you did this, apart from going to dinner parties in Rome itself, would be by passing gossip around in letters. So when people wrote each other letters, they expected them to be copied and passed on, and they would say, you know, just this is between you and me, if they didn't want particular bits passed on. So uh, the sort of presumption was that writing a letter was quite often akin to publication. And here what's happened is, at least within the elite, uh, here's what's happened is that um, Balbus has sent a letter to Cicero, which um, Cicero has then copied to Atticus. And Caesar has sent a letter to Balbus, which Balbus has copied to Cicero, which Cicero has now copied to Atticus. So it's like a sort of third level retweet. Um, and he's never worked very long because this single piece of papyrus that I thought it, kicking myself off, bring it, um, you couldn't actually fit that much on it. Um, and so the way we started to develop um, an, uh, uh, acronyms, uh, abbreviations to, um, to enable themselves to squeeze more off, they say um, things like SVB, so that would be, uh, sorry, SPD. Uh, Salute plur Pluriman Dichet. So you'd say, if I'm writing to Marcus Suravokos, my, uh, my friend, the Roman Senate, and I would say, Tom Marco SPD, and that would be two Tom, uh, sorry, two Marks on top. So that would be Tom to Mark sends many greetings. Um, and, there were other, and then there was, a, there was another acronym, kind of four or five letters that meant, I hope you're well, I'm well, um, and it just kind of let me get, get, get that out of the way so you get onto the message. So you can fit all that on one line, and then you have the rest of the papyrus out of the way. Um, 
of payment. So this is the kind of cost around of information that's going on. Uh, here's another example. So Cicero would sometimes write open letters with the expectation that they would be passed around, and in fact, he'd send multiple copies of them out. Uh, so in this case, there's a, there's a fight brewing, there's a civil war brewing between Pompey and Caesar, which in fact did happen. Uh, but Cicero is trying to calm things down as a statesman, he's trying to hold the Republic together. Um, and so he writes this letter saying this would be bad for the Republic, um, and you know, he sends it to people, um, you know, sends it to a few of his friends to make his views known, and it gets Share the matter. This is in fact what he wants. He says, uh, You say my letter has been widely published, well, I don't care. The other one's not allowed several people to take a copy of it. Cicero is interesting because we have his inbox and his outbox. So uh, when he sends a letter, they would keep a copy of it. His scribe, the Roman scribe called Tyro, who is credited with, among other things, inventing the ampersand. Um, but anyway, um, he would keep a copy of the outbox, the rough draft, and then when people came around and said, Hey, Cicero, he wrote a really good letter about you know, why they shouldn't have a civil war, can't afford it with They'd go, yeah, sure. And then say, Tyro sorted it out, and then so, Tyro would have a copy of that himself, and got one of the scribes to do it. And then that recipient could go and take uh, that letter and show it to their friends, copy it to their friends, and so on. So, there was a lot of information circulating in this way, uh, and they were able to have this kind of distributed com uh, conversation among at least the elite, wasn't it? You know, everyone didn't have access to this, but the elite Romans had access to this, so we see the first example of a social media system. And it wasn't just letters that circulated in this way. Roman books were also actually a, a social media. Uh, what you do if you wrote a book, a book would be a bunch of scrolls all together, and uh, you would choose a patron uh, to dedicate the book to, and you would choose one who had a, a big library with lots of traffic, lots of people going through it, and you would then give him a lovely presentation copy of the book, maybe a couple of copies, and he would put it in the book, uh, sorry, in the library, and people would come through the library and they'd go, oh, this is interesting, and they have a look at it. And if they liked it, they would ask for a copy of it. And his scribes would then produce a copy. And that would mean that your book would travel to another library and would get put in that visiting scholars library. Um, and this is what you hoped would happen, which is why you choose the most influential patron that you possibly could. We see Cicero writing letters to people offering to dedicate books. This is what he's trying to do. And the Roman booksellers, if you went to the street in Rome where the booksellers were, you could tell as an author that you'd made it because the booksellers would have your book. And they would only bother to copy books out uh, and make your available for sale if people were asking for them. And you would get no money at all. So this entire model relies on what we would today call piracy, but there was no idea of the property. So basically, you wanted your books to be pirated as widely as possible because that would mean that people were interested in them. And um, if you went and saw them in the bookshop, that means you'd really arrived. Uh, and the way you would be paid would be in other ways. It would be you know, through patronage, through getting a cushy job, or because you became famous through your books, like Galen, the, um, the great physician, for example. Um, so that's another example. Books were social media for the Romans as well. Um, and then the other thing that was social media for the Romans was news. So the Romans, really, the founder of my profession, if you call it that, trade, uh, was Julius Caesar. So he uh, invented in 59 BC the Acta Diurna, which was a, an account of what had been what had happened in the Senate that day. The daily acts, is what Acta Diurna mean. And uh, Diurna is the origin, the root of the word journalism, um, and journal, and you know, that idea. Uh, so that's where it comes from, Diurna. And this was a newspaper, but it was a rather unusual newspaper because only one copy of it was ever produced. And it was put up in a forum. And if you wanted to read it, you had to go to the forum. Or you had to send a scribe to the forum to copy down the test bits for you. Um, or if you were lucky or you were out of town, you might have a friend to go and send you the highlights. And in fact, we see this with Cicero. Uh, so whenever he's out of town, he can't bear to get out of the loop, and so he gets friends to send him copies of the Acta Diurna, the Daily Gazette, uh, so he can see you know, what speeches have been made and, and all this sort of thing. And speeches would also be uh, distributed like books, you know, they were quite similar things. Uh, if you made a good speech, you put it into circulation so more people could read it than might actually have attended and heard the speech. Anyway, going back to the news, if you wanted to read the news over your breakfast, uh, you would say you're out of the forum and they would jot down the, the best bits of the news and then you could read the news on a quite familiar looking device, which is a Roman iPad. And um, this is in fact exactly the shape and size of an iPad. This is in a museum in Cologne. Um, but this is what the Romans would use to read uh, you know, a bunch of stuff on, and gather it all together and, uh, and read it on this. Um, so, this is an example, I think, of how we think an awful lot of these practices are new. Um, and of course, the Roman examples are different, but I think they're similar enough that they are informative and they're also you know, similar enough to be. 
Well, in some cases, they're actually still quite familiar, they're still with us. So the most effective use of social media at the Roman period was the Apostle Paul. And essentially, he used social distribution of the letters, the epistles that he wrote to his network of churches across Asia Minor. Um, so he knew that if he wrote to one church, all of the other churches would, would get the letter eventually. They all copied their letters to each other. And if he wrote to one, he was writing to all. Uh, and in fact, he was explicitly asked for it. So this is from the letters of the Colossians. Um, so this is, um, he's, he writes, after this letter has been read to you, so he writes to the leader of the church, and yes, he read out of the church. Um, see that it's also read in the church of the Laodiceans. Now they're the next, um, the next church along. And also, that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. So he sent another letter to that Laodicea. So he's making sure that they basically see each other, or retweet these letters to each other. I don't know if you People are walking in this way, they're not going to be like. But essentially, they all end up with the epistles of St. Paul, uh, which is all of the, uh, which goes into the New Testament. It's still being read out in churches now. So that, you know, that's the power of social distribution that's been going on. That kind of stuff has been being distributed through social media for thousands of years now. Uh, and Paul used social media in a very clever way, because at the time he was doing all this, there was a fight going on in the early church about whether uh, Christianity should be a club reserved exclusively for Jews. Uh, or could you, you in fact be a Christian if you weren't a Jew? And um, was it just for converted Jews? And, and Paul argued very strongly that uh, everyone, Gentiles, should be allowed to be Christians as well. And partly because he uh, essentially was able to shape the doctrine of the church through his use of social media, he prevailed, which is why Christianity became uh, you know, a much wider faith than it might otherwise have, have been. Uh, so this is, I think, the, yeah, the earliest example of a really, um, a really clear social media system where you have people passing stuff around. Uh, but there are many more examples in history, and I, I'm going to give you a couple more now. Uh, the next one is also um, starring the Christian church, uh, but this time um, it's a, a rather different setup. Uh, a millennium later, more than a millennium later, Martin Luther also made skillful use of social media. Um, at the time, there was this big argument about whether the Catholic Church had the right to sell the indulgences and these sort of bits of paper that supposedly get you or, or your uh, members of your family who are dead out of purgatory. Uh, and the uh, Catholic Church was essentially trying to pay for the building of St. Peter's Basilica, which is very expensive. So it decided the best way to do this was to sell these get out of purgatory free. Well, they weren't free. You get out of purgatory tickets. Uh, and Luther, along with many thought this was outrageous. He thought there was no basis in scripture for this. And he thought the whole thing was just a con, excusing the poor with you know, scare stories about how horrible hell and purgatory were and uh, gives all your money. Um, so he writes this list, and today we call it a listicle. Um, and uh, it's called the 95 Theses. Um, and today, if it's on BuzzFeed, it would be 95 crazy reasons why the Pope is wrong about indulgences. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's slightly less, it's slightly less uh, you know, populist about the way, the way that Luther did it, because he, he did it, firstly, he did it with, um, he, it was all handwritten, he was in Latin. Um, and he nailed it to the door of the church in Wittenberg, and uh, that was a notice board for the, for the university. And essentially, by nailing up these theses, he was saying, here are 95 things that I would like to have an argument about. I would like to debate these things. Is it really the case that? And he makes a really, really good point. Um, for example, if it turned out that the, um, you know, the church has the power to release people from poetry, then why don't they just release them? Why, why are you making money part of the deal? Isn't that a bit unfair? Isn't that a bit mercenary? If they've actually got the power to do it, why not just do it? Um, and so these were very, very good points, but the, uh, this was a really explosive uh, thing to do, to actually write all this down. Uh, and so people started you know, going to the, the door and going, well, this is hot stuff, and copying it down. So the, uh, the copies of the 95 Theses started to circulate among you know, the academic and the, uh, the religious community. But they were still, this is all still very Roman because they're basically passing around handwritten bits of Latin. What's changed though since the Roman period is the invention of printing. And um, it's not long before a printer gets hold of a copy of the 95 Theses and goes, oh yeah, people pay for this, and prints a copy of it. At the time, you could buy a pamphlet, uh, and books were really expensive, you know, buying a Buying a Bible was like you know, buying a, a Rolls Royce. Um, most people couldn't do it. But a pamphlet cost about the same as a chicken. Uh, so it's something that you could reasonably afford to buy. And so, uh, so people were interested in this, and printers knew that you know, there wasn't any point printing things people weren't going to buy, so they would choose very carefully what to print, and uh, typically do a print around 500 or 1,000 copies. Um, and so 
printers are allowed to do this. People will take a printed copy of the 95 Theses to another town, print it there, make a whole bit, and go, wow. Or people would be going into the printers in other towns, saying, have you got, have you got these um, 95 Theses by Martin Luther? And they'd go, no, what's that? Everyone's talking about it, apparently. So they go and get a copy, and then they make their, they pirate it, basically. Uh, they just type their themselves, make their own version of it. One clever printer realised that you could make the market for this document much bigger if you translated it into German. So that's what he did. Far more people read German than Latin. Latin was the language that you know academic and religious arguments took place. Anyway, so um, the result is that the thesis spread incredibly quickly, virally, through retransmission by printing. And this sort of supercharges the social network in a way that the Romans couldn't, because you couldn't produce fast copies of anything very quickly. You needed you know, a warehouse of slaves to do it. So this is what happens. A uh, contemporary of Luther observes that the age is two weeks for the thesis to spread throughout Germany and only four weeks for essentially most of Europe to have heard about them. Uh, this was an amazing achievement. And this was quite surprising even to Luther. He was not expecting this to happen. He literally just wrote down the thought should happen and stuck it on the, uh, on the door. He didn't take it to a printer, he was paid for it. Um, he was astonished that this happened. He said they're printed and so forth with the thesis, far beyond my expectation. But he realised, he was very um, shrewd, uh, he realised that he became a great opportunity in his argument with the Catholic Church and with the Pope. Um, and, and the Catholic Church did not handle this very well. They basically said, oh, it's not mad, it's not very good. Um, which turned out not to be a brilliant idea. But um, he realised that this was an opportunity that if he wrote what he wanted to say in German, and he wrote it in a deliberately non-idiomatic German, so it could be understood. He didn't rely on local dialects or figures of speech, so it could be understood, understood throughout the German-speaking land. If he wrote a pamphlet like that and gave it to a printer in his town, they would print it and spread on its own. Uh, and so that's what he started to do. And so he realised that he could take advantage of this viral distribution of, of, his, um, of, his, of his work. The audience would do the distribution for him in the same way that the publishers of the Roman newspaper expected the readers to do the distribution themselves, and they did. So this is what happens. Luther starts to write lots of pamphlets, and we can actually see how effective this social media campaign was by looking at his traffic stats. So if you run a website, you know what this looks like. These are the parts of Luther's traffic stats. Um, what's happening here? We've got the, the, the Latin pamphlets in blue down here, and the German ones are in red. So he's writing two lots of pamphlets. He's writing slightly more learned academic um, ones in Latin, where he's arguing with the, uh, the other people within the church. And actually, they do a really bad job of arguing back with him. And he really takes them apart. I mean, it's, great. it's like reading a, a, a battle between bloggers or tweeters now. Uh, because you know, the, first, the first person to come to the Pope's defense said, well, you can't be right, Luther, because the Pope is in battle. And Luther said, oh, come on. What kind of arguments? That's rubbish. You haven't taken on any of my arguments. Um, and it kind of went on like that. It was, it was great. Anyway, so there's, 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 there's blue pamphlets in, in Latin, and then there's the red pamphlets in German. And the difference here is that the dark ones are the, um, are the light bits appear. So the, the dark part is how many pamphlets Luther wrote. Um, so how many he published. Um, and then the light part is how many uh, editions of Luther pamphlets that are basically reprints there were. And you can see that you know, there were very, very, each reprint was probably about a thousand copies. So you can see that big spike in 1523. There's probably 400,000 um, copies, 500,000, half a million bits of paper that year put into circulation. Uh, and there really were, you know, there was pretty much one for everyone in Europe by the time all this was, was uh, finished with. And the result, of course, was the split in the church, uh, you know, the Protestant Reformation, uh, and so on. And this was, you might say, the result of a, of a social media campaign. The main thing was that Luther was the first person to realise the power of audience power of distribution, of peer to peer distribution, of social distribution. Um, anyway, so that's another example. Uh, we've got another example. This one is based in, in London, and it's one of my favourites. Coffee houses emerged in London as social media platforms. Um, like coffee, the institution of the coffee house was an import from the Arab world. And the idea was that it was where you went to discuss things, um, and the idea was that social distinctions would be left behind. Um, at the left of the door, and everyone could talk to everyone else, and you had to be polite. And if you got to an argument with someone, then you had to, in fact, you'd see an argument back here. So I was throwing their coffee over this chap on the, on the left here, so we had a coffee chucked in his face. Uh, if you did that, you had to buy a coffee for everyone in the whole place. And uh, they, the cup of coffee, the dish of coffee, as it's called, um, 
cost a penny. And so these were called penny universities because anyone could go into a coffee house, buy their dish of coffee, read the newspapers, read the pamphlets, it's where they circulated. Um, they could check the news, they would often get their mail in coffee houses because there was no street numbering. So you'd say, write to me at the Rainbow Coffee House, write to me at the Turk's Head, and that would be your email address in effect. Um, so you could go and you could also hear uh, discussions about politics and literature and, uh, and science taking place and participating in them. Uh, so it was a terribly alluring uh, and some people would say addictive media environment. Um, and this is an example of the kinds of uh, things that were passing around. So this is a this is a pamphlet um, that is about uh, the English, it's about one of the first battles of the English Civil War actually. Um, the format of this map, interestingly, is still what the Romans are doing. So rather than just writing about modern journalism, you know, there was a battle today in this town, this many people died, and this happened, here, and these people won. Um, this was took the form of a letter because that was how people thought that stuff that was passed around should look, you know. If you get it in. Some of those people said, oh, I just went down to the battlefield, you know, and I copied that letter to my, my friends, and then what would happen is the news report would be passed around in the form of basically that letter. So this is an actually not a real letter, it's a made up, you know, it's a letter from a gentleman in Kent. But it just allows the writer to use the epistolary form to tell the story of what happens in the battle. And this was quite a common thing. People were still trying to work out, you know, what a news report should look like, what a newspaper should look like. And all of that comes out of this coffee house environment uh, that's happening in the, in the 16th century, in the 17th century. Um, and uh, so this is a great place to go if you want to find out what's going on. Coffee houses are particularly, yeah, they're very commodious for free conversation, hooray, free word, and for reading all manner of printed news and other prints like these pamphlets and broadsides and that sort of thing that come out weekly or casually. Uh, so this is what people would do, and this was the idea that gentleman, mechanic, lord and scoundrel mix and all are of a piece. So the, uh, the social distinctions that are observed in other parts of society were supposed to be set aside in coffee houses, and this meant that ideas could cross uh, between people and cross fertilize and, uh, in, in ways that they couldn't. Um, and coffee houses often specialize in a particular subjects. So the scientists would go to the rainbow, and the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the sailors would go to, well, actually, the marine insurers all went to Lloyd's, uh, you know, because that sort of thing. And so it was, it, uh, and someone like Robert Hooke, who was a great polymath of the 17th century, would go to lots and lots of different coffee houses because he was interested in so many different subjects. The coffee itself, by the way, would be disgusting. And this is because it was taxed as though it was a new kind of beer. And uh, beer, you would pay the duty on advance. So you have the barrel of beer, and the excise guy comes along and you pay him the excise of beer, and he does the cross on the beer, right? So that tells you that it's, it's paid the tax. So you decided to tax coffee in the same way, which you have to make a whole barrel of it first, mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll be cold. And then the excise man will come along and go, yeah, you pay the duty on that. And then you have the barrel behind the counter in the, in the coffee house. Um, and you can see here's the counter up in the top there, I think, because that's what sort of happened to me. Um, and uh, of course, people come in, they want their coffee right away, so you keep some on the boil all the time and kind of chop it up from the barrel. So it'd be a bit like when someone leaves the coffee machine on the boil and it all turns into marmite, it's be pretty horrible. And in fact, the funny thing is that early accounts of coffee do not talk about this wonderful flavour, its wonderful taste. It's compared to soot and old boots, things like that. But the coffee was fantastic, and that's what people wanted. Uh, it's, you know, at the point where uh, Europe wakes up for basically centuries of just cooking it away. And basically, you know, you get all this sort of intellectual flower. I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a, uh, a coincidence. Um, anyway, there's, there's a bunch more examples of um, social media in history. This is a, a commonplace book, um, and this was the kind of tumbler of the uh, uh, the Jew period. And what you would do is you would write stuff you thought was cool in this book, you know, quotes, um, uh, interesting poems, stuff people had sent you, and if you went to visit someone, you might swap commonplace books and you might copy out of their book stuff that you, uh, you thought was interesting. Um, so it was a form of self-expression without actually having to create anything. It was self-expression through the sharing and curation of other people's content. This is exactly what happens on Tumblr and Pinterest, where 80%, 90% of tins or posts are in fact recycling of other people's um, stuff. Uh, so this is the kind of privilege of that. There's lots of other examples too. There's the, the early newspapers and pamphlets of the, the in the run up to uh, both the American Revolution and also the French Revolution. There's this incredible uh, uh, amount of information flying around poets called Nivelle just before the French Revolution, which is which is great fun. So there's a very, very long and deep history of this kind of social distribution of information, people passing stuff around. Um, so the question is what happened to it? Why do you forget this? This ancient social media, uh, something that most people don't know about, we seem to have forgotten about. 
Um, well, the answer is that we went from this kind of distribution uh, in the 19th century, people invented technologies that allowed us to do this. And essentially, uh, they invented things, starting with the steam press and later the radio and the TV transmitter, that made it possible for a small number of people to send information to a very large number of people very, very efficiently. And this had not been possible before. Newspapers are a, a good example. Uh, the first newspapers um, to, to really take advantage of this appear in the sort of 1860s, 1870s. In the beginning of the, um, of the 19th century, the biggest newspaper in the world, the Times of London, has a circulation of 8,000. Most newspapers in America have a circulation of two or 3,000 up until the 1830s. Um, and then the penny press is invented, where you make the newspaper much cheaper, and you subsidize the production with adverts. That's the modern business model for media that we've been stuck with ever since. Um, and you also start to uh, industrialize the printing. So by the 1870s, you've got newspapers with a million copies a day being circulated in America. Um, and so what this means is you end up with a priesthood at the top, that's called the journalists, but you know, also the politicians and uh, business moguls, um, who get to decide what gets transmitted to everyone down here. This is the opposite of social media. It's a one-way vertical transmission of information rather than a two-way horizontal sharing of information. But it's possible for the first time because of technology. The only trouble is that technology is very, very expensive, so only a few people get to use it. And the ultimate example of this is the uh, uh, player, which is the Nazi radio. Uh, this was a radio that was subsidized by the state. It was only capable of picking up domestic broadcasts. It could not pick up foreign broadcasts. And you basically had to listen to Hitler droning on all day. This is a poster board. They weren't really this big, by the way. They just did But this sort of centralized control is the opposite of social media because Hitler was able to use radio very effectively to impose his vision on the German people and then he hoped on the rest of Europe as well. And this is as far away as we can get from a social distribution of information. <coughs> of course, what's happened now is that social media is back because of the internet. So I, my, I, my argument is that it's not new, it's just come back. Uh, because we now have um, new technologies, the internet, that make it possible to reach a very large audience basically at zero cost. So, so that means social media can once again compete well, can suddenly compete with, with broadcast media on an equal footing. It couldn't do it before. Broadcast media was going to overshadow social media before people were getting most of their information from the radio and the newspapers and the TV. They weren't getting it from their friends like they had done for 2,000 years. Um, so I think this gives us a different way to look at the history of media. Um, usually we think about it like this. Oh, we are a new media and the internet shows up in 2000 and that's when everything becomes digital and new. Um, but actually, if you look at my way, Looks like this. <laughs> it was really old me, yeah. Old me is not that old, but it only starts with the penny price of 1833. Um, and before that, there was really old me, yeah. Um, so I think if you look at uh, this, if you look at the history of media in sort of 2000 year perspective, um, you see things in a very different way. And I think that means that there are lessons that we can learn from these ancient social media systems. Um, I think there are quite a lot of lessons, but I'm just going to quickly rattle through three of them. Uh, the first is this question, you know, is social media merely a dangerous distraction that wastes mm -hmm. time? And uh, so people sometimes say that instead of social networking, we should call it social not working. <laughs> and um, this, in fact, is, although we think it's a modern question, it's a very old question. Um, if you go out to the native coffee houses, um, Anthony Wood, an actor in Oxford, is worried that the, uh, the future leaders of the British Empire are just wasting all their time in coffee houses when they should be studying. Uh, why is a serious learning decline? And few or none follow it now in the university because of coffee houses. <laughs> <laughs> this problem is not limited to Oxford. Meanwhile, in Cambridge, um, basically the, uh, the same thing was happening. Hours are spent in talking, less profitable reading of newspapers. Scholars are so greedy after news, they neglect all of it, they're just distracted, they go off to another world. Um, actually, though, this turned out um, not to be a bad thing after all because. Um, Despite claims that coffee houses were great enemies to diligence and industry, the brewing of many serious and hopeful young gentlemen, this is all the 1870s, the heyday of you know, the hey -hey coffee houses. Actually, it turned out that rather than being enemies of diligence and industry, coffee houses were crucibles of innovation. Uh, they were places where people and ideas could meet and mingle and mix in new ways. And we get amazing things coming out of coffee houses, just a few examples of the scientific revolution. Uh, Newton writes the Principia Mathematica, the foundation of modern physics, modern science, to settle the coffee house argument between Hook, Halley, and Wren uh, about the nature of orbits. Uh, I mentioned Lloyd's coffee house earlier on. Lloyd's becomes <coughs> this 
um, you know, it becomes an early insurance broker. It's the first example of an insurance broker. There's another problem house called Jonathan's, which turned it to rename itself to the London Stock Exchange, because it's where all the stockbrokers would go uh, to trade. So they turn out to be these very interesting places that where things could mix and come together a bit like, you know, a bit like internet uh, environments now, but essentially you would get unexpected serendipity and connections with the podcast. You see this in the diary of Samuel Pepys. He's uh, always writing next to the coffee house, and you never know who he's going to be next. Is it going to be a sea captain? Is it going to be a scientist? Is it going to be a merchant? Um, it was really, really interesting because you know really what you're going to see next. Um, so this turned out to be a really, really good thing. And I think we started to see similar thing to the power of social media to encourage collaboration, internal social uh, networking within companies, uh, scientists collaborating um, immediately over social media. I think it's a it's a great thing. So this idea that it's a waste of time, not the whole story, and maybe you know not the biggest part of the story. Um, so what's the role of social media in revolutions? This is something that's been on the agenda you know, since the Arab Spring. Um, you know, did, was that a Twitter revolution? Did Facebook call it? All this kind of stuff. Um, Funny enough, I don't think we can ask Martin Luther. Um, he says, from the rapid spread of the theses, I gather what the greater part of the nation thinks of indulgences. And essentially, what's happening here is that the fact that the ideas are spread tells Luther, sends the signal back to Luther, that other people are interested in what he's saying. And in fact, the people in the audience can tell us too. Because if you go to the printer in town and say, have you got any Martin Luther? Yes, no, sorry, sorry, I can't get to Martin Luther, they all got that. Then you go, well, there's quite a lot of people interested in Martin Luther in my town. Um, so this allows people to do what's called synchronization, synchronization of opinion. It allows them to figure out that other people <coughs> share their views, even if those views are not expressed publicly. And that's what happened um, in the Arab Spring. And I think the, um, the best example uh, to think about this is that social media doesn't cause revolutions. There has to be an underlying grievance, whether it's you know, concern about corruption of the Catholic Church or the corruption of the Tunisian or the Egyptian state or high unemployment or high food prices or whatever. Um, those are the underlying grievances. And what social media allows people to do is it helps them synchronize opinion. It acts as an accelerant. Uh, so it doesn't start a fire, but it helps its fire spread more quickly. Uh, and this is an idea that comes from Jared Cohen of Google, who funnily enough I'm seeing later today. But I think the idea of as an accelerant is, is the best way to think about this. Finally, is social media a fact? Uh, isn't this all just going to blow over and go away? Do we really have to do it? Of course, this is what people said about the internet, and then I've known it. Um, well, I think if you look at the 2000 year history, you can see that if anything, so um, old media here, this sort of traditional media, is the, is the short lived fact. Um, I call this the, the old media parenthesis. Uh, so, this is where the business model of having a local ad monopoly and you know, an advertising supported business model, and basically what all newspapers have been doing for the last 100 years, it worked here. But as you may have noticed, newspapers have had a few problems lately. Um, and it's essentially because this monopoly that they had on distribution of information. Because you need all these expensive pieces of kit in order to do it, you don't need that anymore. So therefore, that business model no longer works. Uh, and new media, what we're doing now, really has a great deal in common with really old media. It's just been supercharged by the internet. So the way I look at it is to say social media is not a fan. It's actually the mass media era that was the historical anomaly in all of this. Uh, we've kind of gone back to the age of the coffee cups with what we're doing now. And in fact, if you think of it like that, it means that modern social media users, uh, all of us today, are heirs to a centuries-long tradition. Um, you can make these very clear analogies between blogs and pamphlets, between microblogs, you know, Twitter, uh, and coffee houses, between Tumblr and Pinterest, and common textbooks, and all that sort of thing. Um, and so, I think we can learn from the examples of the past. I also think we should be uh, looking at social media in a way that we shouldn't be intimidated by it. We shouldn't think, oh no, it's completely new and unprecedented. It's actually just people gossiping at a distance, really. Uh, so I hope I've persuaded you uh, that this is the case. I hope that you will look at the social media platforms that you're using through new eyes. And most of all, I hope I've convinced you that social media doesn't just link us together today, it also connects us to the past. Thank you. Tom, thank you very much for that. Uh, I think we've got, you've got to get, uh, get moving. Yeah, we've got five minutes if you want to keep an egg. Is that going to get straight to coffee? A couple of questions, or we can go straight to our own coffee house. <laughs> <laughs> I do think they have this question. So just a very quick one. Um, Joe Pelz from Wadston Manor. 
I, I'm a communicator and work in the marketing team. And what is really fascinating about the way you've presented this, and thank you for that as an ancient historian as well, I've really enjoyed it. It's all about the control of messages. So the broadcast, our mass media model, we have control over our message, and the social is about releasing control and allowing our networks to do that control. Yeah. And from a lot of people's point of view in my sort of profession, it's realising and communicating that maybe to the expectations of our trustees that social media is a very different yeah. beast. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is really a very useful analogy. And of course, what always happens in the long history of media is that the people who, every time media is democratised, every time it's easier to publish, the people who used to have control go, oh, no, this is terrible. And they all say things like, this is coarsening the discourse. Now, that's what everyone's saying about you know, comment threads on, 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 the, on the web or social media, you know, coarsening the discourse. What they mean is more people can publish who should be allowed to. <laughs> um, and this is, you get this right away from history. You look at how like, Erasmus is complaining in the 1520s that no one is reading the classics anymore. Instead, they're reading this rubbish by Martin Luther. Uh, if he thinks that is coarsening the discourse. Then you get the same thing again in the uh, Civil War with the explosion of pamphlets. Again, oh, all these people who haven't been approved by the king are suddenly publishing. That won't do. Uh, and of course, the point is that one man's um, coarsening of discourse is another man's democratization of publishing. And, uh, I know which side I want to be on. And I think it also allows us to, to recognise what people are interested in. Yeah. And that's actually incredibly useful because we think it's this story and actually. And actually you can see, yeah. And, and then we can follow that. It's, it's, it's very indeed, good. yes. It's a good it's a very interesting time to be involved in all this. Cool. Um, I was just gonna ask, you were talking about how we know there's advertising within the old media. Is there a kind of like a historical place where businesses have gone into like the the coffee house pamphlets where they've tried to different approaches. I was wondering if you there was anything like that. Yeah, um, if you, so the examples I gave, things like Grover Publishing, um, where I've given the books away and they're hoping they'll be quite pirated and then trying to make the money on other things. Uh, so, like, you know, you get a job out of it or the speaking fees or, you know, and actually a lot of authors now earn more from speaking fees than they do from actual sales of books. Uh, so that, in, in a sense, is a return to that Roman model. Uh, if you look at the pamphlets and so on, they didn't make very much money, but the business model looks a lot like blogging. Uh, so if you wrote a really interesting pamphlet about you know, why the king was an idiot or something like that, uh, a printer might say, well, um, I'd really like to publish that, because I think people would, would like that. Uh, you couldn't afford to have it printed yourself, you don't own a press. So the deal that the printer would do is he would print a thousand copies, and he would give you a hundred. So he would pay you in the distribution, which is how WordPress works. WordPress says, you can have a free blogging platform, you can put your stuff on it, and we will pay you by giving you that free distribution. And we may stick an ad or two on the but most of the time they don't. Um, so that is actually quite a familiar model, because what you're really uh, trading is the information for the access to the audience. So again, that's quite a familiar thing. And what you don't see is giant media organisations before the 1830s. You don't see enormous you know, pamphleting. Uh, conglomerates. I mean, it just doesn't happen. It's all much more small scale and social and much more like it is today. Can you say something about the commonplace book about where it was kept, how it was held? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I think you kind of kept it in your room and um, there are examples of shared commonplace books. Uh, there's a really nice example called the Devonshire Manuscript which was shared by a bunch of teenagers in the court of um, Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn and they were all sort of having affairs with each other. Uh, but they were all dropping hints to each other about this by writing poems in this shared commonplace book and changing some of the names. And uh, it's great fun for them. It's been called the Facebook of the Tudor Court. And uh, uh, you know, that was an example, a pretty rare example, I think, of a, of a shared commonplace book. But normally you would keep it to yourself, you would read it um, when you were having a hard time, you would read the inspirational quotes. And the origin of it is that uh, it's, a, it's the Florentium, the idea of the, uh, the basically the priests would keep inspirational quotes often under different categories so that they could pull them together quickly when they needed to write a sermon. And that then, when literacy spread uh, in Western Europe, that became a more widely uh, adopted approach. So, uh, so they were quite personal things, a bit like your phone is, but at the same time they were also used to make information public and share stuff with your friends. Do we have one more question here? Well, yes, it goes back to the um, initial point about the control of information and the distribution of that information. And all of this presents a big challenge for the creative industry and the organisations in this room who look after artists and actors and writers and musicians. And that change in psychology, which means you can afford to let actually more go than historically you have done in order to create an audience for the future, whereas the natural instinct is to try and protect their rights 
and their creativity rather than letting it go. Yes. And actually, that's the big challenge, isn't it? It is, it is. And the fact, the fact that you refer to the creative industry at all, it wasn't an industry. People would, you know, minstrels didn't walk around telling each other that they were members of the creative industry. <laughs> 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 uh, I mean, the fact there was an industry at all was just a problem because it was, it was expensive to, to make photograph cylinders and then, you know, make vinyl and then make. Um, CDs and put them in lorries and send them to shops, and now you can record music and put it on Spotify. So, um, you know, it does mean you have to think about this differently. And what we're seeing is a much, much larger number of, um, of you know, artists, you know, barriers to entry is much lower. The same with, with novels, same with you know, all forms of publishing. Um, we're seeing a proliferation of a much larger amount of supply, and we're seeing fewer uh, you know, breakouts, fewer big stars, but people are much, they have much more choice than they had before. If, you know, I probably listen to completely different music to, to other people because Spotify gives me such an enormous choice. Uh, those musicians are earning less than musicians used to, and they need to you know, um, find other ways to, to support what they're doing. So maybe they're making merchandise, maybe they're doing live performances, maybe they're doing soundtracks. It's different from the way it was before. I wouldn't say it was, uh, was worse. I don't think that you know, the, the way we did things before was, was a golden age, and I don't think it was the right way to do it. You had basically record companies acting as gatekeepers, or publishers acting as gatekeepers. So in many ways, this is a democratization, but it does make it hard to earn a living in a lot of those fields. Could you argue that punk was the return of the space of punk, was a return to that old social media with self-publishing of yeah. And also the pressing of your own, you, know, you, you, you took your recording, you did it all again. They, so I think, that, I think the, um, the specific examples that are interesting, uh, I meant to have a chapter, which I didn't have time to write for this, for this book, uh, which was going to be about analog social media before the internet. Uh, and the interesting examples of it are fanzines, uh, because they are, uh, you know, fanzines are first copy of other fanzines, and also the people who wrote fanzines would often write they sort of protein of social network sites. Because if you wrote a letter to a fancy, you include your address, and then other people who thought the same had the same theory as you did about this day, very happy, could write to you. Um, so they were a sort of uh, social networking platform. But there are other examples uh, floating around. Uh, so you've got Samus Dat in the Soviet Union where photocopiers are used, and then you've also got the circulation of uh, of, of, le of sermons by extremist preachers in pre-revolutionary <coughs> Iran. And they were all passed around with cassettes. Uh, and that's one of the things that kind of gets support going for the revolution is the use of this basically social distribution through cassette tapes. So it, it, it was an interesting um, you know, example of a, a return to uh, a social distribution made possible by um, electrical technology, or electronic technology, but pre-internet. Um, and so someday I'll have time to write that chapter and add it to another edition of this book. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to run away to Google and talk to the AI. So thank you very much.